welcome to this special event with a very special guest. Some of you have attended a previous sessions. These events are, are part of a, a, a series of special events. We had Carmine Gallo a few, a few months ago, Gar Reynolds as well. And now another fantastic special guest, Dr. John Medina, the author of Brain Rules. Again, a fantastic book. Today, we are going to talk about brain rules for effective communication. So we're going to look at the science behind communication. And the reason why that's important is because if you want to be an effective communicator, some of you told us in the chat, like, I want to have some tips and insights to be an effective communicator that you have to have an understanding of how a brain processes and retains information. Because if you don't, it's like shooting an arrow without knowing the target. You might hit somewhere or something, but for sure it's not going to be the target. In communication, you might hit something, but for sure it's not going to be, you're not going to achieve the objective of engaging and influencing your audience. Dr. John Medina is a developmental molecular biologist and affiliate faculty at the University of Washington's Department of Bioengineering. He's the author of many books, including the one I mentioned, New York Times bestseller, Brain Rules. He's been named Outstanding Faculty of the Year at the College of Engineering at the University of Washington, the Merrill Dow Continuing Medical Education National Teacher of the Year, and twice the Bioengineering Student Association Teacher of the Year. He's been a consultant to the Education Commission of the States and a regular speaker on the relationship between neurology right, and education. And before we get started with Dr. Medina's presentation, just a couple of things. First of all, let me see. I see many of you, lots of familiar faces. For those of you who are not with the webcam on, it's completely up to you, of course. But if you feel like it, if you like to turn your webcam on, that would be amazing. That's the best thing we can do to have a good connection with each other. The other thing is, let's make this event as interactive as possible. So during Dr. Medina's presentation, then please do use the chat here on Zoom. If you have any questions for him or ideas, insights, comments, do use the chat. Everybody is on mute. We do that just to preserve sound quality, but use the chat, especially if you have questions that what I'll do after the presentation, I'm going to take your questions and then we have a bit of a chat with Dr. Medina. And before we get started, for those of you who don't know me or, or a company at Ideas on Stage, just a super quick intro. My name is Andrea Pacini. I'm the head of Ideas on Stage UK. Again, we have Phil Wakenell in the room as well from our office in, in Paris, in France. I'm a presentation coach. We specialize in working with business owners, leaders, and the teams who want to become more confident presenters. In the last 13 years, we've worked with thousands of clients around the world, including companies like Microsoft, Lacoste, the World Bank, and more than 500 TEDx speakers. Our mission is to stop great ideas from failing just because of the way they are presented. And our vision is to help hundreds of thousands of business leaders share their message so they can grow their business, increase their influence, and make a positive impact in the world. And that's it. Enough about me. Before we get started with Dr. Medina's presentation, I just want to say a big thanks, big thank you to our supporting partners. You'll find some links in the chart. We have amazing organizations that have decided once again to support us. On, on this event. So you can see here Aspire, the Visual Jam with Grant and Paddy. By the way, if we have any representatives from these organizations, feel free to say hi in the chat. Everyday people with Sam, Tech Italia, there's always a bit of a, an Italian vibe with, with this event, Startups Magazine, and also organizations I love like Social Enterprise, Mark CIC, Impact Hub London, Hatch, at Ideas on Stage, we are big advocates of business as a force for good, purpose-driven business and entrepreneurship. That's why we love collaborating with these organizations. Check them out. Also, stay tuned because at the end of this session, I'll give you a link where you can get access to lots of 
additional resources so you can learn even more discounts, promotions that our partners have, have provided. And that's it. In terms of what we are going to do, Dr. Medina is going to talk for about half an hour. Then we have a bit of a Q&A and that's it. And then we'll wrap it up at the end. So let's go. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. John Medina. John, the audience is all yours. Thank you, Andrea. Um, good morning to you for those of you in North America. Good evening to you for those of you in Europe. Um, as was mentioned, the title of today's talk is Brain Rules for Effective Communication. This is all about how the brain pays attention to things with a special emphasis on storytelling, on narratives, but it really should be entitled, People Don't Pay Attention to Boring Things. And why is that? <laughs> now, we have some admittedly heavy lifting to do regarding how the brain pays attention to things. Um, regardless of what you may have heard or what you may have known about, we actually don't know very much about how the brain pays attention to things. That's because we don't know most of the things about the basics of information processing in the brain. Uh, we don't know how you know how to pick up a glass of water and drink it. We don't know how you know how to pick up a pen and write your name with it in an effort. If we ever did, it'd probably trigger a lot of different awards. Um, <laughs> that hasn't stopped certain mythologies from occurring. And one of the reasons why I wrote Brain Rules in the first place is to try and uh, demythologize a couple of things that are out there. You may have heard that you only use 10% of your brain. I hope most everybody knows by now that that's a myth. You don't use 10% of your brain. You're using pretty much 100% of your brain all the time, even when it's asleep. Uh, you may have heard that there is a left brain personality and a right brain personality, which is totally nonsense because you need both hemispheres to make a freaking personality. And we're not even sure what a personality is anyway. I'd like to give you a couple of examples of how little we know about how the brain processes information. My research interests are in the genes of human development and specifically the genetics of psychiatric disorders. One disorder that's gotten a lot of press over the years is something that's called dissociative identity disorder. And it's gotten a lot of press because its name has been changed. It used to be called multiple personality disorder, but there's two cases I'd like to tell you about that illustrate well how little we know. One is known to the research world as BT. At the time of publication, she was 37 years old. She's German, and she suffers from dissociative identity disorder. She got in a car wreck years ago, a catastrophic car wreck that actually left her blind. She can't see anything, even though her eyes are fine and the cabling that connects the eyes to the back of her head are fine. She is blind. And when she gets into the therapist's office, she is blind sitting there in the chair until another personality kind of takes her over. By the way, we call those alters. They're, think of them as fragments of personality, alter being A-L-T-E-R as an alternate. Alter, she has an alter that is a 12-year-old male adolescent, even though she's a 37-year-old uh, 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 German uh, 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 woman. <laughs> I'll call him Johannes. Johannes, seated there in the chair, would be looking at the psychiatrist, and in one particular episode, looked over at the chair, saw a magazine on the chair, and freaking read the title of the magazine. And he became astonished. And then he looked over at the psychiatrist and could see the psychiatrist, then looked over, actually stood up and started walking around the room because he could see. If Johannes goes away, that altar goes away, and BT comes back to the front, the, the uh, grounding personality, if you will, she becomes blind again, and she, can, she becomes once again a hazard. She can't uh, walk across the street. She can't see the psychiatrist. Does that mean that the brain is so powerful that it can at will shut off or turn on huge swaths of the visual processing system in such fashion that maybe it will ignite the workaround circuit that had been damaged by the car wreck, or maybe it was just a psychogenic instant in the first place? <laughs> we have no idea. We don't know what's going on with BT. We just know that that exists. Here's another example. His name is Bill. Bill is actually allergic to orange juice. If you give him a glass of orange juice and drink it, he will enter into a contact dermatitis. He will start to, he'll start to itch and his skin will get red and fluid filled welts will occur on his body because he is allergic to orange juice. But like BT, Bill also suffers from dissociative identity disorder. And so one of his alters is named Timmy. Timmy 
is not allergic to orange juice. In fact, in the therapy session, if you sit in the, if you have uh, uh, Bill sit in the chair and actually call up Timmy, and Timmy is now a resident as the altar, give Timmy a glass of orange juice, he can drink it just fine, and then he'll ask for another one and drink that just fine. And then, and this experiment was done, ask Timmy to go away and ask Bill, the guy who is allergic to orange juice, to come back. All of a sudden, give him that glass, and now Bill, new personality, drinks that orange juice. By golly, if the red doesn't reappear and the itching appears and those welts go, you can turn it on and off like a light switch. Does that mean that the brain is so powerful that not only can it commandeer an extraordinarily complex visual system, but can actually commandeer an equally complex immune response such that in one personality, you are allergic to something, but can turn off all of those switches in some fashion and in another personality, not be allergic to it? We have no idea, you guys. That's the point. It's how little we know. Now, I have a question for you, which has to do with our topic. Do I have your attention? Do I? Do I have your attention? I can't see you for the most part, but I'm guessing at least in a few cases you do. I teach primarily bioengineering graduate students, occasionally second year medical students, and they're also intrigued with that story. And if they are intrigued, there's a reason for it, some of which concerns our topic and to understand why that might be important, welcome to our half hour together. Now about, uh, probably more like about 20 minutes or so. Our topic is attention. To understand why those two stories might have actually garnered your attention, we have to discuss the very little we know about how the brain pays attention to anything. And to do that, I'm gonna divide the rest of this talk into two parts. Part one, we're gonna talk about the brains behind narratives and storytelling, like I said I would. And then in part two, we'll talk about the, uh, the brains behind what makes information interesting is the title, but it's really how the attentional states work in the brain. So realizing that I speak nearly at the speed of light, if you're taking notes, um, part one, the brains behind storytelling is where we're gonna go. So what do we know about brain science and narrative formation? And why did I start with those two stories? Unfortunately, this is probably gonna sound familiar if you listen to me at all. We don't know very much about storytelling in the brain. We don't. We don't even have a good definition that would make sense to uh, molecular biologists like me who study information processing for a living. Here's the frustrating thing. There have been many attempts to define narrative from Freytag's pyramid to Joseph Ledoux et al's left lateralized interpreter. But from a brain science perspective, we don't really know what a narrative is and don't have lots of falsifiable questions to back us up. Given that paucity of data, I will use three quotes in this little section from three different people, one of which is just gonna have to be an opinion, sorry, to describe what I wanna say about this. So let's go to the first quote. The first quote concerns definitions. Quote number one, I do, uh, I'll get to the quote in a second. I, 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 I wanna uh, caution, I do believe that narratives are a thing, okay, I do. It's just that science doesn't have enough tools to get at it, it's not the fault of anybody, it's just the state of the art. But because of that, I'm forced not to go to the sciences if I want a definition, I'm forced to go to the arts. And no greater storyteller that I can think of that exists in the media today than a guy named Ira Glass, who hosts a radio show on public radio called This American Life. Here's how he defines narrative. It's a good definition. Actually, he's looking at the word anecdote too, but this is a great definition that we'll utilize for this talk. Quote, this is my first quote from Ira. Narrative is a sequence of events you can feel through its form that it's inherently like being on a train that has a destination and that you're going to find something. I love that. A train that has a destination and that you're going to find something. That's the definition of narrative we're going to use. Second quote. This second quote involves a characteristic of narrative, which does have strong empirical support. Narrative whatever else it turns out to be, is profoundly related to certain types of memory. If you want to make something memorable, it's better if you could turn it into a narrative, if at all possible. It's stickier. <laughs> In my book, Brain Rules for Work, I discuss the findings of Chip and Dan Heath in Palo Alto, who wrote the sticky book. They had their classes, you may recall, if, you, if you've read their book, you already know what this famous experiment is. 
for those of you who haven't, um, they had their class do 60 second presentations and were asking for retention and they measured it in a responsible way. Their results comprise my second quote. Here's that second quote. The Heaths found the average 60 second presentation was saturated with statistics, 2.5 on average. Only 10% of the presentations used narratives to persuade their audiences. And yet, when retention was assessed, only 5% of the class remembered any individual statistic, but 63% remembered the narrative, close quote. On average, stories make facts seven to 12 times more retrievable, depending on how you measure retrievable, and depending also on the study. Um, here's one I'll sometimes use in lecture. Sometimes my lecture revolves around uh, how infants encode and process information, particularly if you're looking for psychiatric disorders and are looking at the, uh, at the headwaters. Sometimes my task in lecture is to describe an extraordinary ability uh, of children, even babies, to imitate their environment. Uh, it's called mimetic behavior. But when I'm gonna talk about mimetic behavior, I don't start with that. I start instead with a story, and here's that story. Um, this apparently is from a, a pediatrician. The rumor is that she was from the University of Washington, which is where uh, uh, I reside. She's a pediatrician with her own research project. She actually has, it was on a weekend, so she wasn't working. She has a four-year-old daughter. The daughter's in the back in a car seat, and they're driving along the road, and they stop at a stoplight, and mom looks at the rearview mirror to see how the little four-year-old is doing, and mom notices that she's left a stethoscope in the back seat of the car. And the little girl is grabbing for that stethoscope and is putting it up to her head. And mom is going, oh, be still my beating heart. We're gonna have another pediatrician in the household. And mom gets even more excited because the little girl actually puts the stethoscope on correctly like this. And mom is going, oh, now we're just an entrance exam and 15 years later and maybe $105,000 in debt, but we'll have a doctor. And she immediately gets disabused of her uh, uh, perception because the little girl takes the bell of the stethoscope, puts it up to her lips and says in a loud voice, welcome to McDonald's. Can I take your order, please? <laughs> then I can talk about imitative behavior in little ones. Do I still have your attention? Do I? I just told the story, even though I've got to talk about science. Okay, third quote. The third quote involves an opinion, and it's my opinion, uh, mostly because there isn't a lot of empirical support out there for the stuff that, we, that would be relevant even to this talk. Whatever else narrative turns out to be, it will probably utilize a gadget called theory of mind. And that seems to have been a popular topic this year. When I've been on the radio or on TV, I've just been talking a lot about theory of mind and here I am going to talk about it today. So this is this year's du jour idea, theory of mind. What theory of mind is, is, is this, and then I'll give the third quote. Theory of mind is a cognitive gadget that allows you to understand the intentions and motivations of somebody else. And for some strange reason, we as a species are really curious about other people's motivations and intentions. It's about what makes people tick. Uh, it's got two gadgets, uh, sub-gadgets uh, 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 that comprise it. Number one, it's the ability to peer inside someone else's psychological interior and with very little cueing, understand the rewards and punishment systems inside that interior. That's what's going to make you tick. But secondly, it has a second characteristic, and that is this. When you're peering inside someone else's psychological interior, you are trying to understand their motivation not your motivation. Theory of mind is an outward expression. And the reason why is that they may have rewards and punishment systems that are different than yours. So they're not gonna react like you, they're gonna react like they will. I actually call it John Medina's second law of marriage. <laughs> what is obvious to you is obvious to you. Theory of mind, I believe, forms a very powerful understory of narrative. That's an opinion. Here's the quote. Uh, this is a, um, a quote that is an example of pro-social theory of mind, where you are you peer inside someone else's psychological interior and you are kind with what you see. Here is the uh, a quote from, it's an old website. No one's keeping it up anymore. It was a confessional website. I think it was called trueconfessions.com. And you could write a paragraph about how your parenting was going. And here's a great example of pro-social theory of mind. Quote, it's the third quote. My two-year-old was so cute today. 
My husband was watching football, and when his team made a touchdown, he got all excited and pretended to headbutt me. Except, oh, by the way, this would be American football, so NFL. Um, made a touchdown, he got all excited and pretended to headbutt me. Except I didn't expect it and moved, so he ended up headbutting me for real. It hurt. While my husband was busy apologizing profusely, my little daughter brought me her special blanket she never lets go of and her pacifier and shoved it into my mouth and made me lie down on her blanket to make me feel better. LOL. <laughs> That's a sweet story. It's also a good example of pro-social theory of mind. Was the little girl's head hurting? No, mom's head was hurting. So she's peering inside the psychological interior and seeing that it's mom's head that was hurting, but not mine. That's theory of, that's both gadgets employed for theory of mind. Pro-social, the little girl was kind with what she saw and wanted to help. Hence the moniker of pro-social theory of mind. Okay, now for the opinion. I believe all good narratives have their theory of mind components as their motivating force. I believe all good narratives have in their, in their content, uh, their understory, theory of mind components as a motivating force. And so if you want to make a narrative and you're not talking about the intentions of the people that are in that, um, you probably won't keep their attention very well. Here's an example. This is the old E.M. Forster quote about what turns a, 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 a plot into a narrative or what turns a declarative sentence into a, into a story. Uh, he says, and you can actually do this as a brain science experiment too with uh, 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 non-invasive uh, fMRIs looking for activity. Here's something the brain doesn't like. The king died and then the queen died. Okay, all right, kind of boring, not there. But I can add two words to the end of that sentence that can stimulate something we call the mentalizing network, which is the neurons, neurobiology and, and uh, uh, polarizations behind theory of mind. I'm just gonna add two words to the end of that sentence and turn it into a story. The king died and then the queen died of grief. Of grief. Now you have an insight into the intentions and the psychological interiors of that relationships. Now you have a narrative. Now you have a story. And now I have your attention. I hope. <laughs> Theory of mind is uneven in people. Some people appear to be born with a lot of it. Some people not so much. Consider this letter, this letter written from an advice columnist years ago. Uh, uh, and it's from uh, and Andrea. You're going to like this because he's Italian. Here we go. Dear advice columnist, I am an Italian man aged 34. I am of medium build and am told that I am good looking. I drive a sightseeing bus by day, so I speak a little English. I am single and would like to correspond with an American woman between the ages of 30 and 65. <laughs> she doesn't have to be beautiful, but I want one who has a steady income and owns a late model American automobile. If you know of a woman who would like to correspond with me, please ask her to send a picture of the automobile. <laughs> love Vito in Napoli. So some people don't have a lot of theory of mind. All righty. So story, storytelling, narratives, the brain loves it. The bottom line is you're going to need to use them. That's for sure. Uh, uh, but how should you use them if you're giving a presentation? How does that work with your audiences? Well, to answer to that, we have to get into the second part of our discussion here, where we're going to move away from storytelling and then just talk in general terms what the brain finds interesting, and particularly the neurological apparatus that actually undergirds the little we do know about how the brain pays attention. So if you're taking mental notes, we're now going to get into part two. I'm going to talk about the brains behind what makes information interesting. Well, Making things interesting involving understand, understanding how the brain pays attention to anything, how you're going to separate the signal from the noise, how you're going to lock down onto something. In my world, we call it selective attention. At the 40,000 foot view, selective attention has two processes that undergird it that work together. One is called a spotlight process. In the, in the visual world, in visual research, it used to be called the attentional spotlight. Uh, it's, it's actually uh, a broader concept these days. One is the spotlight. The other is a filtering system. 
And they work in a cooperative fashion together in order for you to lock down and pay attention to something. And let me give you an example of this by telling you a story. <laughs> I've started two um, uh, brain research institutes in my time. One is called the Tolaris Research Institute. A uh, $100 million gift. We, they bought a, 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 a big, huge 18-acre plot in the Laurelhurst area of Seattle, which is uh, this big, beautiful park with rhododendrons and bushes and, and a fountain on it. And I spent one of the most delightful days professionally I ever had walking around the property, signing and thinking about where I wanted the, the laboratory research facilities to set, because they were going to build one in those days. It, it, they never did, but it, it was a start. When I'm busy walking around uh, that property and looking at all the rhododendrons that are out there and the grass freshly mowed and that beautiful fountain, all of a sudden, a dog comes charging at me and he was not nice and he was had his teeth bared and he was running as fast as he could because I have obviously pissed him off because I am now in his territory and I did everything you're not supposed to do. I looked him in the eye and I ran in the other direction and I backed up against a hedge and he was coming towards me and I wasn't sure what to do. When I saw a branch laying down on the lawn, literally, I picked up that branch, I waved it, got as big as I possibly could and then just ran towards him yelling the word it's the only one that could come to mind i yelled the word dog <laughs> to my relief the dog didn't know what to do with that and he ran the he turned tail ran in the other direction and i started running after him and i stopped thinking i'm now caught in a looney tunes cartoon what in the world am i going to do next <laughs> if i slow that story down if i slow that process down you can see both aspects of the attentional apparatus in the brain working in concert to allow me to pay attention to something. Number one, the attentional spotlight. Here comes this dog. And all of a sudden, I've been looking at all the other things. I'm now focusing on this. Here comes this dog. And it's a threat. So I need to get it. I'm going to need to pay close attention to it. The second thing, though, is, is what also happens that a lot of people miss when they're talking about attentional uh, 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 habits in the brain and attentional processes, there's a filtering system that also works because at the same time I was selecting for the dog, I was deselecting all the other information out there. There were beautiful rhododendrons in bloom. It was a spring day. There was a beautifully mowed lawn. That fountain was busy going like crazy, but I ignored all of that. I filtered all of that out in order to be able to pay attention to one thing. Okay, that's how they work. So next question. How do, what do we know about how the spotlight and the filter interact together? Well, we know that the spotlight generally uses emotions. And by the way, we're not sure what an emotion is either, just to be honest. The, uh, we, don't, we don't know what they are. We actually know what they do, though. We actually think they work as post-it notes. They can actually post it. There's lots of information out there, but if one is emotionally competent, you can use that emotion like a post-it note, and it'll post it there, and the brain will then say, okay, I'm going to have to pay attention to that for further processing, maybe later, maybe right now. In the case of the dog coming at me, it's going to be right now. So the spotlight is going to use emotions. The filter doesn't use emotions, though. The filter uses the cognitive decision-making capabilities, usually harbored around in the prefrontals, that allow you to pay attention to one thing and not pay attention to another thing. The ability to toggle back and forth between those two has been intensely studied because it's the hallmark of what happens to people when they have ADHD, attention deficit issues, where it is they have a hard time focusing or defocusing, and they have a hard time filtering out other pieces of attention. Both of those systems are not in operation as well with people who have attention deficit. So now they can cooperate with each other. They can also override each other, and occasionally they'll even ignore each other. And to talk about that, I probably have to share what is probably one of the most famous experiments in all of the uh, attentional sciences that exists. And I'll bet about half of you know it. It's the Shabri and Simon Great Gorilla Basketball Experiment. If this were a class, I would ask you now immediately how many of you have heard of this. Usually when I do that in a lay, uh, in, in a, in a lay lecture, about half the people raise their hand. So for those half of you who know about the Shabri and Simon work, go ahead and take a break for a second. For those of you who don't, I'll describe it briefly. I can't show it to you, it's copyrighted. I used to use parts of it when I, was, when I would teach a class and then I would do my own survey. And so this is what happens. The original experiment has, is a, uh, has people in white t-shirts and black t-shirts and they're busy throwing basketballs at each other. And your task, you tell the class, your task is to count the number of times a person in, say, white t-shirts 
how many how many the times uh, the, a person in a white t-shirt t-shirt actually touches the ball so you're going to do an accounting experiment so every time a, a person in a white t-shirt touches the basketball with all these balls flying around you're supposed to write it down okay the tape is about three minutes in its original form so you you play that and then at the end of the three minutes uh, i will then stop the tape and then say to the class um did any of you see anything funny in that video we just saw about 70 percent will say no about 20 percent will also say no but they're uneasy and the other 10 percent, you guys are laughing their heads off and the reason why is this halfway through a minute and 30 seconds into the video some guy i'm not making this up some guy in a gorilla suit comes out waves at everybody and then exits stage left so total exposure there's probably 1500 milliseconds or so a lot a, a lot for the brain to be able to process and so a lot of the kids won't believe it so i have to slow it down so they can actually see it now here's the question why is it that essentially 90 percent of the class didn't see it you can actually show that the gorilla actually there's photic exposure it will actually make it into the eye and into the brain the reason why they don't see it has to do with the interaction between the spotlight, by the way, Shabri and Simon call it the inattentional blindness, between the spotlight and the filtering system. A gorilla is not supposed to be where people are throwing basketballs. So the brain takes you up on that and says, okay, like a Photoshop editor from hell, I will just extract that image and you won't be able to see it. You're not gonna pay any attention to it and we'll just have you focusing on the basketball. So you have the spotlight in one sense and you have the filtering system in another sense and they have this uneasy relationship with getting you to understand reality. <laughs> now, how does that work with public speaking? Uh, when you're presenting data, well, let's get into the woods with the spotlight a little bit and then get into the practical parts of this by saying a couple of different things. The human brain processes meaning before it processes detail. That's important to understand. The human brain processes the meaning of a piece of information before it processes the detail of that information. So what does meaning mean? How do you focus on the spotlight? Well, I generally tend to distill it into six questions that the brain asks when a piece of information is coming into you. Okay, so I'll just state those six questions. This is not literally the science, although it is literally the Darwinian impulses behind what brains pay attention to, what meaning before detail actually means. Here are the six questions. And it will, whenever a piece of information is coming into your head, you ask the six questions too. Number one, will it eat me? The brain is the world's best survival organ. So it's actually interested in if it's gonna to survive to project its genes to the next generation. Number two, can I eat it? <laughs> it's only 2% of your body weight, but it's 20% of your metabolizable energy it takes. It's an energy hog, so it's deeply interested in surviving by looking at an energy resource. Number three, can I have sex with it? Number four, will it have sex with me? The whole reason for the Darwinian selection is to project your genes to the next generation. So of course, we're going to meaning will be a, a, a sexual response, particularly what is called appetitive sexual responses. We would know the word as arousal. That's what we tend to pay attention to. Number five and number six to me are the most interesting because there's no a priori for them. They just exist. Have I seen it before? Have I never seen it before? It turns out we are terrific pattern matchers and we pattern match and lock down all the time if we possibly can. Let me give you an example of that pattern matching, then tell you a little bit about utility and then I'll be done and we can take some questions. Okay, um, I'm gonna give you a sentence and I'd like you to answer it in your mind if that's okay. This is gonna be for uh, uh, an example of questions five and six. Have I seen it before? I've never seen it before. Okay, ready? There are, are three things wrong, wrong with this sentence. Okay, I'll say that sentence again because I'm gonna ask you to see if you can find all three. There are, are three things wrong, wrong with this sentence. Can you find them? Occasionally I'll say that uh, in class and people will look at me and they'll say, uh, well, Dr. Medina, I can get two things because you said the word are, are and wrong, wrong. There's two things in there. You know, what's what's up? Where's the third thing? And then they look at the sentence and then they get an aha because they look at it and it says there are, are three things wrong, wrong with the sentence. But there are not three things wrong with the sentence. There's only two things wrong with the sentence that you guys, therefore, the entire sentence is wrong. And boom, they get it. And I can ask another question. 
Do I have your attention? Do I? Your pat if, if you've never heard that before and you try to pattern match off of it, all of a sudden you lock down onto me. Part of the meaning has to do with pattern matching, and that's the point. Okay. So three rules. I'll be real quick with this. Uh, I have about a minute left, and I can do this in probably 45 seconds. Number one, you're going to need to be competent with getting emotionally competent stimuli inserted into your presentations. You're going to have to make, I call them hooks. You're going to have to make them emotionally competent. And then you're going to have to pulse them into your presentation one every 10 minutes on average. That's the old, it's called the Bill McKeechee rule. It's actually been updated now. It's 11 minutes and 40 seconds from an article that was literally published in Nature. No kidding. Uh, if you're doing a standard lecture. If you're doing more of a video type lecture, like what we're doing here, probably you're going to need to give a hook every five minutes or so. On average, for this presentation I gave here, I'm averaging about every three and a half to four minutes or so. Because what you do when you do that is that especially if you then follow rule number three, rule number one is make it emotionally competent. Number two is pulse them in regular intervals. Number three is turn it into a narrative whenever possible. For whatever reason, storytelling makes information sticky. It certainly makes information sticky. And if you are regularly pulsing very interesting anecdotes and emotionally competent stimuli every 10 minutes or so, and most of the time it's a narrative, you probably will win your audience every time. Woo! Okay. I'm done. The rest of the show is brought to you by you. Andrea, back over to you there, buddy. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. That was great. And before we take, we do have, we also received a few, I received a few questions privately in the chat. Before we look at some of the questions, I have a question for everybody. Can you please let me know in the chat, what's the one thing, just one, one thing you are taking away from... Dr. Medina's presentation. It could be anything. It could be an idea, an insight. It could be something that you knew already. Maybe if you if you read Brain Rules, but it was a good refresher for you. It could be something that now you've decided to apply to your next presentation, speaking opportunity, communication, depending on what your context is. So let me see. Yeah, feel we pro we process meaning before detail. Yeah. Attention, I see if Robert, emotion is important in the hook. Yeah, if you want to grab the audience's attention. Joanne, brain, same as Phil, process meaning before details. Helen, the need for story and emotion. Yeah, spotlight process and filtering, lose. Yeah, the frequency of the hooks, Glenda. So just now the 10-minute rule, which could be even five minutes if we are communicating online. Todd, yeah, Todd, I love that. What's obvious to you is obvious to you. So it may not be obvious to, to others. Keep a story going. Perfect. So thank you very much for that. Now, John, a, a few questions here. One comes from my colleague, Phil Wakenell. And he asks, he would love to know if you rewrote brain rules, if you rewrote it today, what would be the 13th rule? For, for those who haven't read the book, there are 12 rules there. What would be the 13th rule? Phil says, we've learned a lot about the brain in the last 20 years or so. So there must be something new. Sure. What, well, what are your thoughts, John? Oh, there's thousands of things that are new, but the 13th rule would be an old one. And it's simply this. Psychological safety is everything. Don't forget it. If you are a manager and you manage other people, one of the most important things you can do, particularly in a post-COVID world where mental health issues are becoming blossoming out from underneath us in ways, in horrifying ways, statistically, that we've never seen before, you're going to need to pay attention to the psychological safety needs of the people you're working with. And the reason why is simple and straightforward. The brain is a survival organ and is not interested in your bottom line, and it's not even interested in cooperating. It's interested in surviving. And so the 13th rule would need to be emphasized with that, with the idea being that mental health is at stake if you don't. That would be my 13th rule. Thank you. There's a question from Maria. She says, how do you include hooks? So you talked about hooks, John. How do you include hooks in reports? So say that you are not giving, you're not delivering a presentation, but you are writing a report. Is right. there a way to 
to include hooks to capture the audience's attention when you write a report, for example? Sure. Well, I, I can't answer that directly. I, I don't know of any literature on reports, but I can tell you what I do with my own books. Every 400 words, you get a hook. <laughs> so if you're going to write a, an 800 word uh, presentation, an 800 word report, make sure that there are two hooks. Uh, it's extraordinarily important, especially if you're writing them, because people can go back and revisit those hooks to provide the references behind it. So people, often people want to get other information, like other people want that Shabri and Simon experiment. They would like to see that on their own. If they have the reference where they can click on it, that would be extraordinarily important. And one of the reasons why I say that's important, because you could do that in a report that you can't do in a physical presentation, is because I am deeply concerned with the amount of mythology. I thought it might have a chance to go away with the internet when people could actually look at, you know, get on the NIH sites and take a look at, see if uh, pieces of information were replicated and whatnot. With chat GPT, I'm not so sure that I have that optimism anymore. So the ability to include an actual reference from refereed literature in vetted sources is going to be an extraordinarily important thing to do. So the counsel would be, if you're going to give a report, if you can give a hook at the beginning and then give a hook in the middle, say if it's an 800 uh, page report and references at the end, you probably can still keep your audience. Question from Alan. So John, you talked about the, I think it was, yeah, it was one of the six questions that you talked about. One question was, have I seen this? The other one was, have I not seen this? Yeah. Alan is asking, does the brain prioritize this too? Like is one question more important than the other? Yes. One is more important than any of them. And that is, will it eat me? Mm. <laughs> threat. Uh, unknown can be a threat. It's one of the reasons why I started with those two uh, case studies about dissociative identity disorder. That's mildly threatening. We have no real understanding of how deeply and how powerfully the brain can influence even physiological processes that we thought were not under psychological control. <laughs> like your immune response, okay? <laughs> if you literally, and that's not all. There are people that will not respond to a drug in one personality, but will respond deeply to another, I'm thinking of analgesics, respond deeply to another drug in another personality. So that can be mildly threatening. So the very first, it, it is very important to remember uh, that the brain is the world's best survival organ and repeal, appealing to threats is a big old deal. Uh, the other one though, sex, uh, you don't have to use utilize it be inappropriate with reproductive uh, opportunity. Many of the neurons that are involved in making us laugh are also involved in sexual responses and pleasure is with, with both. It's one of the reasons why humor will sometimes work as a hook, as an emotional hook in the middle of a speech, simply because it's it's tickling those other areas of the brain that might uh, have as their day job something else. But the very there is one priority more, to answer the question more than anything else. It's out to survive to the next day. There's a question from Todd Churches. Todd says that your your book, John, especially the chapter on vision, has had a tremendous impact on his visual thinking work. Again, Todd is the author of great book, Visual uh, Visual Leadership. And he says, can you talk a little bit about the pictorial superiority effect? Sure, sure. Yeah, the PSE, it's an old term. It has, needs some nuance these days because there's additional data, but the core findings are still, are, are, are still valid. And that is when everything else being equal, the brain pays attention to pictures more than just about anything else if you do rivalry studies in the laboratory. It not only pays attention to pictures more, it pays attention to moving pictures. And more than that, it pays attention to moving pictures that are rotating in three dimensions better than anything else, which is why when you go to a 3D movie and something pops out of that movie and you see it, people don't focus on the backgrounds, do they? <laughs> no, they focus on the thing that's right in the center. And if the thing is moving, and particularly the thing is moving at you so that you're going to get a threat response, man, the brain is just going all kinds of, okay, I'm paying attention, I'm paying attention, I'm paying attention. The pictorial superiority effect is still there. Nearly half of the brain's processing features are involved in visual information. So we, now, we know that the uh, number of resources that the brain is devoting to uh, uh, visual processing is powerful, as opposed to a sense that's actually going away. <laughs> and that is our sense of smell. Our olfactory sense is demoted in that list. 
There's no such thing as the olfactory superiority effect, except in one interesting case, which we can talk about. For the most part, if you have a presentation where you're actually seeing something that is visual, the brain will lock down on it. And that is as true now as it was when, at the time when I originally wrote it. And the references are still valid. Perfect. We have a question from Stefan. I think we've got time for maybe two more questions, more or less. Stephanie asks, how do you make information or... John, you talked about narrative. How do you make it interesting if you don't know your your clients, or we could say, I can add these, your audience, in your audience's pain points and what's meaningful to them? Oh, man, that's a tough question. Because, um, Andrea, you and I were talking before uh, 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 we met about the importance of, of saying, and it's your great insight, um, it's not you. It's your audience, and you need to pay attention. You're 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 not trying to make a good presentation. You're trying to make a good presentation for your audience, because it's the audience has the has the primacy of that. I suggest, particularly in situations where you can do this, is to learn as much about your audience as you can. Learn as much about their intentions and motivations as is possible. If you can't, if you have to fly blind, and sometimes you do then just remember what the brain naturally prioritizes as an evolutionary history. It is not an opinion that the brain pays attention to threat more than just about anything else it does. So everybody in your audience is going to pay attention to threat. So telling a mildly threatening story or one that is interestingly enough that the meaning things get triggered. So you've got a pattern matching issue that's around or maybe it's something that's humorous. I try to in just in our half hour together, try to mine in all three of those, starting out with maybe a mildly threatening story, but then moving to Vito from Naples who could not, who wanted a picture of the uh, American automobile to at the very end, looking at pattern matching, uh, mixing and matching all of those. So if the first council is pay attention to those six questions, the second council would be when you're making your hooks every 10 minutes or so, mine from each of those, maybe do threat once, maybe do humor once, maybe do a pattern matching another time so that you're continually mixing it up for your audience. They'll pay attention to all of those and they may find it more interesting because they'll certainly find it more varied, if that makes sense. If it Thank helps. You, John. Let's, I was, let's, fi uh, oh, let's finish with one final question from Gordon. Gordon is asking, so you talked about, will this hit me, which is the, the most powerful question. And he says, okay, will, does, for example, will these damage my professional standing or will these invalidate my sense of identity? Does that count? And uh, will this hit me? It utterly counts. Yeah. In fact, we have a name for it. It, if you feel like it's going to eat you, we call them thymotic desires, T-H-Y-M-O-I-T-I-C, thymotic, thymotic. What thymotic desire is, it's the desire to be respected by your peers in such fashion that they value what you have to say. We all have it. There's a strong evolutionary reason probably for it in the sense that if you are considered to be a valuable member of the team, they're more likely to come to your aid if you get in trouble. <laughs> Whereas if you're a jerk, they might just say, yeah, we're leaving you to the, you know, to the saber tooth cat caves. Go, go have a good time. When you, if you feel like your thymotic desires are under assault, or if you choose to be nasty and as a spear, try and poke somebody else's thymotic desires, you have all of a sudden entered into a threat component and a threat behavior that's actually not very nice. It's not conducive very much to learning. You're never going to get a lot of information from it because people will focus in on the threat. Uh, it's sometimes, by the way, if you want to Google this, this is Beth Loftus's work, L-O-F-T-U-S, and she has something called weapons focus. So look up thymotic desire and weapons focus and all of that will come right to you. Thank you again, John. For for me, it's been, before we, we are approaching the, the end of this session, for me, it's been an absolute pleasure and honor, a privilege to have the opportunity to host, to host this event with, with you. So thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it for sharing your, your insights. Now, for everybody, let me let me share a couple of final things. So I promised at the beginning I would give you access to a few extra resources. So you can see here, this is the virtual goodie bag I mentioned at the beginning. You have the QR code, you've got some, you will have some links in the chat. And this is a you also have a link here in the on the slide. You you can get access to lots of additional resources where you can learn even more free resources, discounts, promotions from our supporting partners. So check it out. Again, all the links are in the chat. Also, a couple of other things. 
One is the Confident Presenter Scorecard and the other one is the Masterclass. The Scorecard, I saw that some of you have taken it before the session, so thank you for that. For the others, if you haven't taken it, check it out. Again, the links are in the chat or you can take a screenshot of the slide. This is a way, it's an online tool, which is free. It takes less than three minutes and you can use it to assess your current presentation, public speaking, communication skills. And you just need to answer a few questions and then you'll get a score. That tool will tell you what the score means for you. And it also identifies opportunities for improvement. So check it out. That's the scorecard. The other thing is a regular masterclass. This is a presentation skills web class on Zoom, which I run every, every other week, more or less. How to avoid confusing your audience, even if you're not a natural presenter. You don't have to be, as long as you follow a certain process. These are free sessions, less than an hour, 45 minutes. We've got two days coming up in the next few weeks. So again, check it out. The link is there in the chat. And one other thing, if you are interested in what we do, potentially, if you are interested in communication skills, public speaking presentations, then just let me know. I would be very happy to offer a completely free one hour presentation consultation to see if there might be a fit between what you may be looking for in this area and what we have to offer. And regardless of whether or not there's a good fit, I can promise you that if you attend the consultation, you walk away with much greater clarity on how either you can become a more confident presenter and communicator, or if you have a team and if you want to develop a team of confident communicators and presenters, we can talk about that. And you'll also walk away with a free copy of my new upcoming book, Confident Presenter, which, by the way, July the 18th, save the date. I'm going to publish my new book on that day. We are going to do a book launch event as well on Zoom here. So save the date. We haven't published it yet, but we will soon. We don't have the final details, but Phil will be there. Todd Churches will be there as well as, as guests. So save the date. I'm going to give you more details, but... If you express your interest in the consultation, just, just as a thank you, I will give you, before anyone else sees in the world, I will give you access to the PDF version of the book. So if you are interested in the consultation, then just type a quick yes in the chat. And then what I'll do is if you type yes, first of all, you are not committing to anything. You are just expressing your interest. You are just telling me that you'd like to learn a little bit more about what the consultation is about. I see a few yeses privately as well. Feel free to express your 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 interest privately in the chat or in the public chat as you prefer if you type yes you are just expressing your interest and also that doesn't mean that we'll go ahead with the consultation what we'll do is if you type yes i'll get in touch i'll give you more information about the consultation and then if we see that it makes sense we'll find the time to speak and that's it now before we close we've got just a few minutes today we talked about a couple of things we talked about science and communication or the science behind communication and if you think about if you think about communication i believe that any difficulty in your role in your business in your careers can be traced back to a communication deficiency for example if your business is not growing for sure somewhere there's a bit of a lack of communication skills if you're finding it hard to lead your team there's a communication deficiency. If you are finding it hard to make an impact for causes you care about, there's a communication deficiency. Any difficulty in your business, roles, or careers boils down to a communication deficiency. So if you think that that might be the case in your situation, that you need to be intentional about what you're going to do about it and when. Because you see, many people attend sessions like these, they watch webinars and YouTube videos, they listen to podcasts, and then what do they do? Nothing. They procrastinate. They think that now is not the right time, and so they'll wait for the perfect time. The truth is, there will never be a perfect time. The perfect time to start your journey to becoming the best presenter, the best communicator you can be, is now. Mastering the art of public speaking can be rewarding. It is rewarding, but there's no reward without action. In this context, good things don't come to those who wait. So again, if this speaks to you, here is my invitation to you. Start your journey now.
Start your journey to becoming the best presenters you can be today, not tomorrow. Start your journey to becoming the best version of yourselves as communicators today, not tomorrow. And of course, if you do choose to start to start or to continue that journey, I'd love for you to share with us. Let me know if you're interested. Again, feel free to type yes in the chat if you want to express your interest in the free consultation I mentioned. If you've started that journey already, that's great. Keep going. You won't regret it and your audience will thank you. And thank you very much. I want to say thanks again to Dr. John Medina, to all of you for, for attending today, to our supporting partners. Again, check them out. We've got the links here. And let's keep in touch. All the very best. Ciao.